Welcome to the SAG-AFTRA Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Ariana Davis, and I'm the Senior Director of Editorial and Strategy at Oprah Daily. Today, I am so excited. Like, you, I hope you can feel through the screen how excited I am as a Bridgerton super fan to be hosting a conversation with the brilliant cast of Netflix's Bridgerton. If you haven't seen Bridgerton yet, which let's be real, you most likely have because Bridgerton was seen by, I think, more than 82 million households and has earned the honor of being Netflix's biggest series debut of all time. So quite the honor. But if you haven't seen it yet, know that it's an incredible series. It's romance. It's a period drama. It's set in Regency era London. And I'm here today with three of the female cast members, Phoebe Dinovor, also known as Daphne Bridgerton, Nicola Coughlin, also known as Penelope Featherington, and Claudia Jesse, who plays Eloise Bridgerton. Welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I also wanted to mention that the, the foundation has set up a COVID relief fund for, in order to support thousands of union performers who, are, who have gone through tough times since March 2020. So if you're interested in donating or you want to learn more, you can find more information in the description section of this video. Now on to Bridgerton. I have many, many questions for you ladies, but first I want to ask, you know, it was all, Bridgerton was all anyone could talk about last year. And now any small little detail about season two, people are like, jumping onto it, they want to know more. What do each of you think it is about Bridgerton that really just has enchanted people? I think firstly, it came out at a time when people really needed an escape and um, Bridgerton really is an escape. It's sort of a fantasy fictionalized world um, of high society where everything's rather glam glamorous and amazing. And, you know, I think it's a, a real mixture of, of, the incredible scripts and uh, the um, incredible costumes and the incredible sets and uh, all these interesting characters that have, you know, very different story arcs and, um, you know, are beautifully diverse. So I think it's sort of a, a mixture of all of those things that created such a wonderful escape that everyone connected with, I guess. And the romance. I can't, I can't, I can't go without talking about the romance. Yeah, I think that, that, that helped as well. And I'd be curious, speaking of the romance, I think that romance, romance novels, but also romance movies, I feel like they, there's kind of a stigma that it's like they're for, you know, women of a certain age and they're, you know, it's, they're not as highbrow, but I feel like Bridgerton changed that in a lot of ways. Do you guys feel the same way that, that it was kind of a game changer for the stigma around what we think of as, as romance? I think massively because I think that female projects are so consistently undervalued by people and they go like that's not worth making or we don't want to hear that story but I think audience responses to things like Bridgerton showed that there is such a hunger for things like this and also it was nice to change people's expectations because I'd never read a romance novel before reading you know The Duke and I that was my first foray into that world but there was something I think we were, we had a huge disadvantage in a way because people didn't know what to expect but the way that people responded and it's it, it, I think Bridgerton is a really joyful show and there's not a lot of that on television. So I think that's maybe what people connected to with it. Oh, I love that. It was joyful. It was, I, there were so many, like, I was literally just home with my puppy on the couch, just like swooning, literally. Oh. <laughs> I, I love that you, that you called it joyful. Um, Claudia, I was curious for you specifically, because in addition, I think to this being, I think it was a game changer for romance and also a period drama. Um, I loved your character of Eloise. I think that she, you know, she plays a very strong and independent woman that you didn't necessarily think of when you think of that time. What was it like for you as an actress to represent that type of character? And did you find any similarities with Eloise? I think like, what I find in most enjoyable is that she, she's, I've, you know, sort of described it like this before, is that Eloise is the one with the megaphone, I guess. At, she's at the vanguard sort of shouting about it and, and or like just expressing herself about it. I think the reason it's so, you pick up on it so much um, is for two reasons. Like one, you see that backdrop and you see the early 1800s and you assume, you know, we assume that that sort of attitude or spirit wouldn't really be that present, but you know, it started somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Like there, you know, some, there was some badass woman was somewhere that allowed us to have, you know, this and, um, and that continues obviously. And another reason is that um, you pick up on it a lot because 
she's one of the only characters that doesn't really internalize. Like I think the everyone else, you can see that they're struggling to communicate or struggling to express themselves. Um, whereas um, Eloise doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't struggle with that. So again, and alongside that, you know, um, I don't think Eloise is the only one who has a quote unquote feminist uh, spin or narrative. You can see that it's really intelligently um, uh, peppered throughout the show with all of the characters with, you know, Penelope on her uh, quest in her life and Daphne and the boys, you know, struggling with a dukedom or struggling with being the man of the house, you know, once the, you know, the Bridgerton fathers passed and you see all of them struggling with the idea of patriarchy and what it is doing for the people, um, for people and what it is not doing for people. Um, so, and similarities, um, uh, both enjoy a cigarette on a swing. So... <laughs> One of my favorite, I, that was one of my favorite scenes. I love that so much. Um, Phoebe, I wanted to ask you, I, I read that you grew up around the acting and in the industry. Your mom is an actress, your dad is a screenwriter. Um, I'm curious for any any uh, actors who are watching this, how your parents' careers inspired you to become an actress yourself. And if this is something that's always been a lifelong dream for you. Yeah, I mean, I think I was lucky in that sense that I was just always surrounded by stories. You know, my grandparents were in the arts. You know, my my grandma was um, an AD uh, and my grandpa was a director. So I think I grew up, you know, hearing at dinner parties or constantly just stories about actors and sets and theatre and so it just seemed like such a fascinating world to me from a very young age. So I think the seed was implanted uh, very young. And then I just started to, I guess, be more interested in, in, in reading and, and going to the theatre and, and just knew that, that I wanted to be involved. Um, so I think I was lucky in that sense because I think a lot of people find it later, maybe if they 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 don't have parents or or don't know anyone in the industry, um, it kind of can seem like a faraway dream, but it it's not. It's um it's just that it's definitely a very different world, and if you don't know about that world, it seems like a leap. Um, so for me, it was I I was lucky to to see that it wasn't, you know, there was a way in. Um, and then, so I guess, yeah, then it was just about finding how I was going to get in <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, and just, and keep learning from, and keep asking questions from the people around me that, that knew about their side of the industry. And luckily everyone, one in my family is in like a very different side of the industry. So I got all the sort of stories and, um so yeah that that was uh that was my way in I love it I love it Nicola your turn I wanted to ask you about um your your role and specifically Penelope because Penelope very quickly I think became a fan favorite on the show and even before I was gonna say spoiler alert but I feel like if you're watching <laughs> you haven't seen it like but spoiler alert before we know who Penelope really is um she became a fan favorite. And so I was curious for you as an actress, what it felt like portraying um, this character that got so much love and, and what that experience was like for you. It's a really beautiful thing and it's a big honor to play her. And even before, you know, we started filming, I started looking into the books and the fandom behind the books because this was a huge love for Bridgerton way before our involvement in it. You know, it's a pre-existing world. So I realized how much that the fans loved her and how much she meant and what she, I think, represents for people. We've all had that unrequited love and have all felt like the ugly duck duckling and, you know, all of that type of stuff. So I was aware of that. But then I think when I stepped onto set, I had to let it go a little bit because I think you can do all your preparation, but sometimes knowing all that or having that pressure can, can hamper you. And you have to think, I just need to go in and, and play her as a real person 
experiencing experiencing these things i can't think of how many people in brazil <laughs> love her i have to just think of her as this is penelope in this room doing this and it, it's just been wonderful the response has been has been so lovely and it, she, she's an interesting character to play because she's such a ball of contradictions in that she's very shy and quiet but then she you know she's got this sharp sense of humor and she's super observant but won't say anything and you know some people say like what's the real her and i think well it's all it's all the real her human beings are complex and that's the thing i think you get from being in a chandelier show that the women are not going to be one dimensional and go she's the bad one she's the good one and that's they're against each other they're all going to have very messy complex complex things about them and she's yeah she's very much all of that so you mentioned that there was a huge fandom already in bridgerton i the, the fandom of Bridgerton novels, like if you just Google and you go into like message boards, it, it's a rabbit hole. Um, so there yeah. was a buzz about the show before you guys were even casted. So can you talk a little bit about each of you? What was the audition process and how did you, what was the audition process like for each of you? And how did it feel when you finally landed the role? Claudia, you go first. Yeah, I think, I think um, I sort of figured something like I think I think Nick we've said this to each other before that we expect it to be like a like a seven audition sort of yeah. process right like yeah. yeah like all of us would just be like which they're, they're, they're not they're not fun when you because it's great when you get far down because you're like okay I must be doing something right but by the fifth one you're like I don't even know yeah. if I want this anymore <laughs> this is torture but um it was one like so for example me and Nick I, I know that for sure I'm not sure about i I haven't ever spoken to you about it, Thebes, but I know that for me, Nicola, it was it was one audition, and then like like a month or something later, I got I got a call, yeah, saying I got Eloise, and um, I guess the characters are so they've established such wonderful characters, like we said, they they're like who you know we work hard, obviously as actors, but like for me, like Eloise is very she is like that's who she is on the page, certainly is in my view anyway um and so I guess they must have felt like when they saw it they saw it like they and they they and they knew um and I always I just I remember thinking you know you get a job every now and again that comes up and you're like oh I would really like this one you <laughs> train yourself to I do anyway to once I've gone for something to sort of delete everything from my brain and my phone I get rid of all of the emails about it I just like sort of delete um, and sort of go, well, there you go. It's done now. It's out there. But with this one, I was sort of like, found it harder to delete because I, I really wanted it. Um, but I and, I and I remember just being, it was like the best audition I've ever had. Um, Kelly uh, Hendry and Cole Edwards like, did a really spectacular job. And it was the most joyful audition I've ever had. Um, yeah. So thanks. Thanks, Kelly and Carl. <laughs> yeah. her because she was great. Um, Phoebe Nicola, what about you guys? Well, mine was slightly different. I mean, I want to say first off that, well, I did, I remember the first audition because it was just a tape and I was in New York and I just had so many tapes and I just sort of, it was like one of three, you know, I, I was in like that process of like, I really fucking need a job, like mm. just doing as many as possible. And so it was, it was quite rushed, honestly. It, it wasn't like I had time to like really sit down and like process what it was. So then I forgot about it like almost immediately. And then sort of two months later, I think it was. And I was going through like a really weird phase of just like getting so close to stuff, not getting it, wasn't working, was like really just fed up with the industry I guess I was just like I just am done I'm spent I've done everything I can I'm not getting there and I, I was in a position of like f this you know like <laughs> I'm gonna be honest because this is for the actors out there <laughs> um and then and then yeah and then I got a call saying they you know they've they've cast Simon and they want to they want to oh no I, that no, I got a call first saying Chris and um and Betsy Beers want want to meet you and just have like a general and I just read with them and it was so chilled, and and I was again in a place where I'm never going to get it so I may as well just do it do whatever I think and hope for the best and then yeah and then a week later 
reggae had been cast and I, I went in, read, read with him, did a chemistry read. And I remember saying, I remember saying to him um, after we did it, because it felt good and Shonda was in the room, which was really t- terrifying. Um, <laughs> but I, again, was at a point where I was like, whatever, I don't care anymore, <laughs> which I think is a really actually good place to be in as an actor because you sort of just end up leaving everything on the door and just being like, yeah. goodbye. Um, <laughs> so I literally was, <laughs> was like... <laughs> <laughs> um, I literally remember saying goodbye to reggae and being like, oh, have such a good time. I was like, it's such a great role. You're going to be awesome. <laughs> I was like, whoever plays Daphne, she's going to be great. I just, like, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> I literally, I mean, he, he always tells the story. I was like, see ya. And then I never <laughs> I'd see him again. And then the next day they called me and said I got the part. And I was just really shocked. And then, and then, yeah. And then the self doubt kicked in. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds a bit familiar. I was like, fuck, I've got to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, life of an actor. Imposter syndrome yeah. is real, but obviously you did something as 82 million households, girl. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So Go on. on. Oh, so I was sort of in a similar boat to Phoebe, and that I just had a run of months and months of really unsuccessful auditions and was kind of just at a point that I think it's a weird thing and I think a lot of actors will relate to this this when you don't get a job you sort of are like well I'll never work again you start that voice in your brain goes well you've gotten a job before but you you had a run of luck and it's over and it's just never going to happen and then you start believing that and it's so insanely unhelpful but you can't counteract that so when my agent rang and said Shonda Rhimes is making a Netflix show I thought well I'll never get that and what Claudia said or that will be months of like really painful auditions in and out and meeting executives and you'll never get it and then it'll be on Netflix and you're like annoyed and you went oh I auditioned for that at some point so I only had like very little time to prep. I think I had a day or two days with the script. So I Googled and found out it was a, you know, it was based on books, but I was like, there's no time to read them. Let's just do this script. And I think, you know, in any audition, you just go in and you make a choice and you don't know whether it's the right choice. So I met with Cole just um, and did a tape and he was like, that was great. And I went, yeah, like I didn't particularly feel like, whoa, I've really <laughs> blown it out of the water. I was like, sure. And I was like, this is audition one of a million, if even I ever hear from them again. Yeah, and then I got a call about two weeks later and my agent said, yeah, they want you to do it. And I was like, what does that mean? She's like, no, no, no. (laughs) I just don't know because it just seemed like that seemed crazy (laughs) to me. Because I was like, I don't know how they know when I don't know. And then as I, you know, read on about the books and realized who Penelope was and how integral she was, I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. You know, but then Chris um, has said before that Shonda very much has a feel for who's the right actor for the part and you know looking at her track record you'd be like yeah I guess you know (laughs) let's let's trust her but I think it's harder to have that faith in yourself than what she has in you you know I love that I love that so much I don't know what this means (laughs) I don't know what this means she phrased it in a way that she said and the creatives want you for it was her exact phrasing and I said well what is that what's that I don't oh like the next sentence was going to be like but no, I think it was really like, you know, it wasn't like the final final. She was like, it Got needs it. to be signed off by certain people. Maybe wow. just in case Netflix were like, oh, she's a murderer. So like, no, then you can't have it. <laughs> and I wasn't and they did like, we're like, no, you can't, you, you can't do it. <laughs> so, no. Yeah, I didn't understand what she meant. When yeah. you crazy. I mean, a Shonda Ryan show, I would imagine as an actor is probably like a a lot of even extra pressure because it's Shonda Ryan. So it's a, it's a whole. Of course. Yeah. Um, I was very sorry that you put faith in me and I'm terrible you know sorry yeah. I was very grateful for my audition because Shonda I feel like she you know she was there but she didn't make me feel like her presence was that like she was she knew exactly how to behave in front of an actor so that I didn't feel terrified um because Shonda Rhimes was sat in front of me um so she, yeah she's she's I also think she's just so instinctual I think yeah. she's no, she like just knows, doesn't she? Like immediately. Because Claudia and I had a discussion before about how the show could have been cast and who were like the obvious choices for different parts. And it's like interesting because they didn't go for any of that. 
nobody in this show is like the really super, super obvious choice. It's a way more interesting. And also as an ensemble of actors, there was a lot of actors I admired, like Polly Walker and Johnny Bailey going into it. And I think that's, you know, credit to Kelly, Nicole and Shonda, like working together. Mm. You guys all had such great chemistry together. So clearly they know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> I have to ask the question, Phoebe, about the sex scenes. Because I just need to know, like, I feel like the the the, the chemistry between Daphne and uh, the Duke of Hastings, I think, is one of the, obviously one of the things that people love the most. And so I'm curious for you, if, if you were nervous or if you had to, like, work your way up to just even the, the love scenes and that chemistry between them as an actress, what that experience was like for you preparing for the role, knowing that like, you know, that's a big part of the storyline of Bridgerton. Yeah. I was excited to tell the story of like the female gaze and the way the conversations that we had were all, you know, uh, we're all, we're going to do it from the female gaze. It's going to be uh, and, and I just hadn't heard of that really before. And we're going to work with, you know, an intimacy coordinator and it's going to be very um, rehearsed and blocked. And, and I, I was just intrigued. And, and honestly, that like really hard work <laughs> doing like some of the sex scenes that we did, a couple actually would take like all day because they're a stunt, they're filming a stunt. Yeah. So we rehearsed it and blocked it like a stunt or a dance or whatever and it was just super specific and they and me and reggae and our intimacy coordinator and and we worked really really hard um and spent a lot of time on getting them right uh and they are not um as 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 sexy as they look um in real life they are very much uh, a navigation and a a figuring out how the heck we're gonna do this um, and make it look real uh and I'm honestly genuinely really proud of them because uh we were able to keep everyone safe make sure everyone had a voice and an opinion and um and do it in a way which looks really authentic and real. So I'm, I'm, I'm super proud of, of them. I love that. I love, and I love that you were excited about the female gaze because that was one of my favorite parts about it too. It felt very much like it was inclusive of female it, viewers, and I just love the way that yeah. they, it, was, it was beautiful. And done. female pleasure, which yeah. is something that like is a new thing apparently that 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 women have orgasms um, by sex toys. <laughs> It's like a new thing. Daphne didn't have a sex toy in those days, but um, <laughs> but they did have orgasms. Yes. So uh, yeah, I, I really w- thought that was a really important message really, I guess. Uh, yeah. I love that. Um, Claudia and, and Nicola, I would love to hear from you guys about, I feel like another fan favorite was the friendship between um, Eloise and Penelope. I was curious from you guys why you think that the friendship was so beloved by viewers and, and what it was like for you as actors, um, really getting into character of these two young women who are such good friends. It's unaffected, isn't it? Like, so it's one of the most like freeing, relaxed relationships you, you see at first, because obviously you see, straight away you see like <clears throat> either an incredibly like you know there's a scene with Johnny Bailey and, and Sabrina you know having sex up a tree and then there's sort of like where's my son he's supposed to be here and then there's like Daphne meeting all you know everything's so heightened and there's loads of different like frictions and friendship and then there's just Eloise and Penelope you know like waving at each other at the thing it's, like, <laughs> it's the sweetest I guess it's the most sort of like oh, this is nice, like, sort of, like, relationship to see, and you do need those breathers. And also, I guess it's, you know, it's female friendship as well, isn't it? And yeah. and you can see them, and it's that wild age, isn't it, Nicola, where they're yeah. trying to figure out but what the hell is going on. All the time about how, like, in, in season one, they're, they're 17, they're, they're babies, really, and they're 17 in 1813, which is a whole different kettle of fish, and like they don't know what sex is and they have no agency. They can't go and have careers or go to college or any of that stuff. Um, I think maybe I think what people found relatable about it is certainly what I felt reading the script is that they didn't read like these dusty facsimiles of Regency women. They felt like real young women 
that, you know, they're just the same as women are now, but in different sets of circumstances. So I think, you know, it, that's a lot of that is in the writing. And I think also one of the things about it is that they just genuinely really love one another. And that's like a really beautiful thing to see. And we don't see enough of it on screen of, you know, two women just going, you're my girl and you're my girl. And this is just, it's just a special thing. That's so much. It's so funny. I think I, I hear a lot of that when people are surprised that Oprah and Gail are such good friends. And I'm like, why are we surprised that two women best friends and that, you know, that they're a positive example of friendship. I think I, I love that about Eloise and Penelope. It's so yeah. Good. Um, I have to also ask, I always wonder this about actors when there's like a mystery character on a show. I'm curious for how each of you found out who Lady Whistledown was. Again, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Bridgerton, stop watching now. Um, but I'm curious how each of you felt, uh, when you, how you each found out who Lady Whistledown was and, um, and what, what your reaction was to who she was and also that she would be voiced by the iconic Julie Andrews. I can't remember the story of how we found, because I feel like Nicola knew first. Well, I found out in a really bizarre way. As I said, I didn't read the books because I didn't have time before the audition. So it was post that I, you know, bought the fourth book, which is about Penelope and Colin, started reading it. And then my impatience got the better of me. So I started going on the fan forums online and I found out on a fan forum that Penelope was whistled down. Spoiler, sorry, we're going to say it. They went, but they've had you warning, it's okay. And I was like, oh my God. Like I really didn't see it coming. And then when I met Chris, we had our first in-person meeting. I was like, but am I her? And he said, look, you are. So, cause that, I mean, changed everything about what I did. Do you know what I mean? If I didn't know that, and they could have taken it any which way. It's an adaptation, it doesn't have to mean, but I had to, I had to know going in whether that was their trajectory. And then it was fun on set. Cause sometimes people be like, I wonder who it is. And I'd be like, do you want to know? Like, I can tell you if you want to know. Um, yeah, that's, that's how it happened. That's how I found is out. It? Is it? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Nicola yeah, I was like, I can't him. tell you, but I know, actually, I will tell you. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not, I'm not like Penelope. I'm not good at keeping secrets like that. I get too overexcited and have to share. <laughs> I remember Luke Newton's response was my friend. who was like, no, it's not. No, is it? And I was like, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Claudia, do you remember how you found out? From Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> so Nicola. <laughs> Here. That's cool. such youngest child energy that I have to go around <laughs> telling everyone like I'm just a parody of myself Jesus <laughs> it's cute but also you know um a lot of us had gone into the books you know to to, to get that you know I'd gone to four or five. yeah no yeah I'd gone to four so yeah and that's where you'd you know you'd find and also it was on like forum like I feel like there was a forum that I saw it on or something yeah. right right like people chatting about it but yeah and it's obviously it's wicked it's wicked for for us to know that it's Nicola as well so it's brilliant because we love her so it's like it's fantastic it's like the best news ever we're like this is go Nick like it's, it's amazing <laughs> I yeah. can imagine that because I think even I I I will admit I loved it so much I watched it twice don't judge me Oh. And, and I watched it going back through I was like just the, the small subtle ways that in your acting it was almost there were little winks I feel like where it was like oh how did I not you know like I just feel like it was it was so brilliantly done I mean it that was so fun to do because mostly you know the scenes were about Daphne and the Duke and that was the focus and I kind of go to the director and say but would you mind if I just snuck myself in here and like I'll, I'll mind my own I'll do what I'm doing and you that like that's I know that's the focus but I just but I thought that would be fun for people to go back and like just spot the points at which she was there you know but yeah it's a balancing act of not making it too overt but still having enough of it if you know what I mean yeah I thought it was so great um before I let you ladies go I have to ask about season two what can you tell us where where, where are you guys in the process right now has filming started and what what can you tell us that we can expect without any spoilers? Although I will take spoilers, but I'm, I'm not allowed to actually officially give them. So Daphne dies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tragic as well. It's really tragic death. And all of our faces are like, what can we say? Yeah, what exactly. can we say? Okay. Bridgerton becomes a thriller in season yeah, two. Yeah, it's all set yeah. in space, which is a real move, but so interesting. <laughs> You're going to love it. Um, the <laughs> underwater sequence is there. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I guess we'll have to tune in to find out more, but um, <laughs> so, so great speaking to each of you. Thank you for your time, and to everyone watching at home, thank you for, for tuning in, and I will be wait, tuning into season two for sure. Um, good luck to all of you guys. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.